Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started again. Where we had left off, we were looking at this whole notion of this kind of funny shell structure. We are putting some beams in there. We're going to play around with a couple different things. We're going to play around with kind of the issue of kind of the instance variables being changeable on a rib by rib basis. We'll also look at kind of changing the geometry on a rib by rib basis. And then the third thing I want to talk about is the whole issue of lofting and surfaces and how that works. That's kind of a Another kind of point of confusion in all this, but let's see if we can sort of come up with a good example that will give you a chance to get your questions answered, and we'll think about how it applies to your project. Okay, so a question that came up at the break that I'll kind of just uh, continue to try and help you distinguish the difference between is, again, it's this notion of using points versus reference points. Okay, and whenever you can, I'm advising just go ahead and use points, not reference points, because we don't need the reference points. We can create our nerves, curves just by points. We don't actually need the reference points to work with. And then the geometry you can create is in a Revit project. So almost every place where if you have x, y, z points, and then you say you're going to go create a curve, as opposed to doing by reference points, if you just take the x, y, z's, you can sort of skip that and then get a little bit of a kind of, but it's, it's cleaner code, or at least you don't need to go through and uh, kind of get Revit involved in computing that. Unless, of course, you really are trying to create a family, but I think most of you probably aren't. But we'll take a look at it on some individual cases. Okay. In terms of making the example work and sort of playing around, I'm still not sure what's exactly going wrong in terms of the holiness of the three-point taper beam, or the taper tube. But here's one that will work that'll let us go with. So if you can, if you, uh, in the example file, if you're following along, just go ahead and load in the family called adaptive beam. So go back over to, it'll be under session six. Under the examples, go to adaptive components and see if you can find just uh, adaptive beam. That one actually seems to fold nicely. So we're gonna use it for our purposes today. So bring that in. And when you do, go through in the code and where it says family types, change it to adaptive beam. You can then go through and run it, and you should get something you know, like something like that. And it's kind of doing OK. So there's a couple different questions. One is about the whole issue of the instance variables, and can we change that? The other is, really, can we do something to kind of change the waviness of this? And they both actually start with the same sort of answer. That we're really just trying to look for some sort of basis by which you know, we can make a change that has some sort of mathematical basis to it. So for example, on these ribs, if you're following these ribs and we're starting to change them, you see, oh, what do they have in terms of different uh, values? They have this notion of a web thickness, a bottom flange, a top flange, beam depth, and stuff like that. So these are all type properties right now. Okay. If we go through and we change, okay, they have the type properties, what's going to happen is it's going to change all those different beams, which is, if we want that to happen super, but if we want to be able to change them on an individual basis, then we're going to change a parameter from a type <coughs> parameter to an instance parameter, and then we can change it independently. So if there's any parameter that you want to be able to change individually, you can say, choose the object and say, edit the family. We can sort of see how it is defined. Okay. You can sort of see you know, the profiles and the basic geometry down there. But if we want to look at the parameters, we go to the family types tool. And we can choose that beam depth. And we can edit the parameter to say that it's supposed to be a type parameter. We want it to be an instance parameter. That will go through and just make it changeable independently or individually. Don't turn on reporting parameter. Reporting parameter is something where you can't change it. It just reports the values independently. Just make it an instance parameter. And that would allow you to do that. And I think that, for the most part, some people are playing with that. You can go through and kind of change those things on almost any object. So 
The net effect of making that an instance parameter is now I'll be able to go through and change any one of those independently. At least I think I should. Let's see if it actually works. Doing a lot of kind of regenerating right now. Let's hope that doesn't crash. Okay. Looks like they've regenerated. Let me kind of take a look and see if I can change those independently. Again, I always try changing things first just in Revit, because if I can't change it here, it's not going to work in Dynamo. So let's just try something different here. If I made that like five, okay, super. It is going to change. So let's come up with some scheme, as Jen was asking. It's like, OK, we want to do something that's going to be able to change the beam depth. We have the x's and the z's are pretty much doing things. So y is kind of my candidate for what I'm going to look at. If I go through and, for example, I change the beam depth so it's always somehow related to the y value, that's kind of one way to do it. OK, so let's think about how we can do that. We have all these different points. Okay, and all of these different points have different y values associated with them. But we can get those lists of points, and then based on those points, pull out the y value and use that as a variable. You know, or that's some sort of a value for computing, and like uh, like set the depth of beam based on it. For example, if I went through and just grab either any of these curves, the upper, the lower, or the middle curve, and I say let's grab all those points. I get a list of points that have x, y, z values, and I can use a function called point dot y to pull out the y value. Okay, so let's see if we can make that happen. So I got these three different lines. There's line one, line two, line three. And you might remember they're made up of all sorts of different points. I'm hoping to be able to show you, but maybe not. I'm not sure why you're not showing me. <laughs> Thinks I'm putting in a code block. But if I take that list of little points and I say that I want to, I'll get it from any of them. I'll say point dot y. This should give me a list of different y values. So let's see what this looks like. OK, what are you complaining about? Let's see what I got here. I got a line. Those are surely a bunch of points. Oh, it's the line. Excuse me. What I want to do is I want to get the points. Actually, not the line. What I want to get is the, uh, hang on. I'm going after the wrong thing. At start point and end point, what I really want to do is get, because I put the points along them, let's create curve points at parameter. I'm looking at the wrong one. What I need to do is actually do it out of this thing, uh, this curve points at parameters. What this was done doing was it was taking the line from start to end and putting the points along there intermediately. So what I can do is, if I only want to get one of them, this will actually get all of them. Okay, pull out those y values. There you go. Let's see what we got. So here's the y values in each of the lists. So 0 going all the way to 100. It's actually sort of matching because we're also doing that. So I got a bunch of y values. What I want to do is basically somehow take these y values and convert it into something that I can use for the height. OK, so let's think about this. I got all these adaptive components. What I'm going to do is element 
set parameter. I can spell properly. Name. Okay. I'm going to take this list of elements. Again, I can take the individual adaptive components because I'm changing an instance parameter. If I was going to change a type parameter, I'd feed in the family type. Okay. We need to say what the parametric value is that we're going to name, what the parametric name is, and I believe it was bean depth. Let's just check to make sure. Bean depth it is. Notice it's both are capped and there's a space in there. So I can say bean depth. I'm going to put it in the quotes to make it a string. And now I need to somehow put these values in here. So what kind of values am I going to put in here? I know over here I have values that go anywhere from 0 to 100. Okay, so what can we do? We could go through and, well, a couple different things we'll do. One is I actually have three different lists here. And I really only want to get one of those lists. So I'm just going to say list get first item. Because I there are the three duplicate lists, but I only need one of them. Actually, get item to index will work. So if I get just the things at the zero at index, okay, that is now just a list of those points. And it's still calculating in the background there. So if I have a list of zero to 100 and I want to change the B this, what can I do to that to sort of make it look interesting? in terms of setting these parameter values by name. I could go through and sort of apply some sort of a transform and say, oh, it's going to be 2 plus something here divided by something like that. But if I want to sort of put a little like sine curve in there or something like that, let's think about this. Somewhere between 0 and 100, if you want these things to sort of be sine curvy like if you want it to be a single wave, Okay, going fat and skinny, kind of wave like that, it would be going everywhere from 0 to 360, because 0 to 360 is a single wave, 0 to 720 is two waves. So what I want to do is come up with a way to rescale these numbers so that somehow these translate into beam depths. Okay, so let's say the minimum beam depth would be like one foot. We never want to get to less than one foot. At the highest value, we would like it to get, or let's say like five is the average, and it's going to get anywhere from two greater or two lesser. So it'll go anywhere from three to seven, or something like that. So five plus or minus two, or five plus or minus three. Okay, so that would be five plus or minus the sine value, okay, then amplified by three. Okay, so let's show you what that is. So uh, I am going to go through and compute the beam depth. And what I'm going to do is take these values here, going anywhere from oh, 0 to 90, actually goes up to 100, I think, by the time it gets all done. And I'm going to remap them. Because what I want to do is I want to map them into a range of values that look more like degree values. So, and this is going to be something very similar to what you may be doing if you're putting a sine wave in here. I'm going to say math remap range. And I got a lovely list of numbers here going 0 to 100. In my new improved world, these are going to be 0 at the minimum. And at the high level, if I wanted to get a single wave in there, it would be 360. Super. So this is going to give me a range of values going all the way from 0 to 360. That's looking good as sine values. So now I want that little kind of uh, mathematical function. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create something. It'll just be a code block where I'm going to say it's really going to be represented with beam depth. But we're going to take sort of a minimum beam or the average beam value and then the, the, the amplitude of the variation. So it'll look like this. Okay, so I'll call it just the average beam depth. Okay, again, it's just a variable name because I kind of want to make it very visible to myself. 
then it's going to be plus, and it's going to say the it's math dot sign in uppercase. We learned okay. of uh, what is it? This is going to be the y value. times the amplification. Okay. So what this is going to do is, for the average beam depth, I'll just put in a number, like 5. For the y value, or the degree value, that's this list. And then the amplification, that's going to be, oh, really, whatever you want that to be, if it's plus or minus 3. So what this should be returning now is a list of values that looks like 5, then positive, then negative, kind of coming back to 5 again. So let's see what it looks like. A little calculation action over here. Looks like it's still working. Yes, that's true. OK, come on. Show it to me. That yeah, drawer won't show that to me all the time. When that happens, what you can do is just put a watch in. Watch does the same thing. There we go. Okay, so can you sort of see that's five plus or minus three? If you've got values, if you've got y values, and you have parameter names, you can now pull those in as the value, and then it'll do that and kind of adjust the thickness. So that's one way to attack the whole idea of adding some curviness to it. So we're just changing the beam depths. Let's see what that actually looks like back over here. I think it's computing. Is it? Oh, it's still computing. There it goes. It's doing a little work in the background there. So that's one way to do it. Let me check in with you guys as we're doing this. Does this sort of funky logic of basically trying to pull out a y value and then do something to adjust the y value and then use that y, does that sort of make sense? Because the same thing happens when we're adjusting the edge of the curl. Yes. So if you have NURBS, um, uh, NURBS curve, Yes. Um, how do you how do you get the item out of the index we'll from a that. specific level? Okay. Yeah. Let's think about it. Okay. So I think it's it. See what you got. Yeah, what does get item at index do? Just oh, that just in this case, it's because when I said point y it gave me three lists of y values, it's just pulling out the first so that, yeah. So I have three groups of ten and they're all duplicate. So that's all that's doing for us. So that's kind of the idea of very fat to very skinny beams. OK, so that's one thing we can do. The other thing we were thinking about doing, though, was really kind of, as opposed to just being a flat line, going through and you know, kind of having a little more curvature, a little more scalloping on the edge of the shell, something like that. And let's think about how we can approach that. Because it's really going to be a very similar sort of operation. Like, right now, there is a set of points that is this n set of points here. In the same sense, if I want to sort of change the z values to kind of make it go up and down with a little more scale up, I can take all those and basically just say, hey, there's a z value. Let's go ahead and pull out the z's. Or actually, no, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is, in this case, if I want to change it based on the y, have it go up or down, but then change the z, I'm going to grab the old z. I'm going to compute some factor to add or subtract to the z, and then swap it back in. That's right. sense. OK, Caesar's shaking, so he's sort of getting that idea. Let's just kind of see if that's making sense to other people. We're going to go through and like go through, and for all these different points, we're going to go through and say, OK, great. You know, you have an existing z. They're all going to turn out to be the same right now. So we're going to get the old z. Okay? We're going to go through and figure out some either addition or subtraction based on the y, and then swap that in for the z. 
That's how you get a skull. Okay? So let's try that. So I have, let's see if we can find it. What do we have over here? We have those lines that look good. We put some nice points at the parameter that look good. Okay, that's looking pretty good there. And what do we want to do? We want to basically We'll do the same thing here. And we did those adaptive components by the points there, transposing them there. Okay, we're looking pretty good. Here's basically what I want to do. I got these three different curves over here. You know, the last one came from that last line over there. What I want to actually do is do a little transposition because what I want to do is, as opposed to working with, or translation, I guess is what it would be, yeah, working with these points, one, two, three, what I would really like to do is for that last set of points, which is driven by this last straight line, I'd actually like to substitute something else in there instead. I'd like to substitute in there a curvy line as opposed to a straight line. Okay. After that, I'm just thinking ahead, all the rest of the logic is going to work the same. This is really made up of three straight lines, the bottom line, the intermediate line, and this kind of upper line. So if I swap that upper line for a wavy curve, it'll go through and really have the same effect. It'll just kind of make that upper edge scallop as opposed to being straight. Okay, so this is my uh, point of attention right here. So what I'm going to do is as follows. I am going to take that line over here, okay, do a little subdividing on that line, and then figure out how to give it more of a sine value. So let's do that, and we're going to swap it in. So I got a line over there, and let's go ahead and, again, we're going to do a little curve by uh, point of parameter action. Okay, so. I can take this guy over here. Actually, I do want it to come back to, no, it's going to be a line. That's okay. You can do it in your number of Let's just do curve point at parameter. <clears throat> Drop that in here. What I'm going to do is take line three up there. Okay. Now we're going to divide it into a number of points. Those points are going to really be used just to go through and compute these revised sine values for it. Because what I really want to do is just replace that. I thought it was an easier way to do this. Really, I just want to replace a straight line with a sine value. But I think this is going to be the best way. I don't know. I'm, I'm always debatable about ways to do things. Okay, but. If I took that to starting and ending point and I said that grade, I'm going to go 0 to 1 to, I don't know. I'm just basically going to give it like, a, you know, oh, I'll call it like 20 points. Because all I'm really trying to do is get some points on that line so I can dip them. Okay, that's going to give me a whole bunch of points. Let's go ahead and for all those points, we're going to pull out the X's, the Y's, and the Z's. So Diana could do this for us because she's an old pro at this now. Basically, this is a whole bunch of points. Let's take a look at them. There they are. So I got those X values, I got those Y values, and I got those Z values. That's pretty good. What I want to do is I'm going to get the X values, I'm going to get the Y values and the Z values, I'm going to use the y values as the basis for computing a difference, and I'm going to swap that in on top of the z value to make it actually have that curve. Okay. So here's what it looks like. I'm going to take those points and say, hey, let's go through and do this whole point x. That'll get all the x values, a nice big chain of them. Let's get all the y values. 
That'll get all those values, a nice big chain of them. And let's get all the Z values. Okay, so, so far, all we have is a bunch of Y values, a bunch of Z values. It's these little lists of points. Doing a lot of calculation in the background. Once we have the x, y's, and z's, what we are going to do is it's going to look amazing like what we did over here. We're going to figure out, okay, how many, uh, how many ripples do you want in your curve? Or how many scallops or something like that? So we're going to take those y values and we are going to scale them because I want the lowest y value to be the beginning of a sine wave. I want it to go to an even number of sine waves. So what I want to do is rescale this to some factor of 360. Okay, so I'm going to say map, remap again. I'm going to take my beautiful y values. The new minimum is going to be zero. The new maximum. You can have a little bit of fun with this if you want to. If, for example, you wanted to sort of change the number of waves, the rippliness of it, you could say, really, it's just some number of times 360. You know, it always wants to be an increment of 360. So I can go through and put in number of waves times 360. That way, I'm just going to pull that up so you can sort of see it a little better. I should clean up, put some uh, groups in here so you can see better. Then uh, for the number of waves, I'll put like two waves. Like two complete circuits would go 0 to 720, basically. So you'll see this is now going to be all scaled from 0 to 720. Okay. Once we have that, we are ready to do something that's amazingly like what we did over here, this whole computing uh, of the sine wave. So we are going to say, great, with those, let's compute some new y values. Although this is going to be a little interesting, I'm just going to go through and for this one compute they all have existing z values, either sort of a raise or a lower. Yeah, from that. Okay, so we're going to say that it's really going to be a code block. Could you copy paste the other one and just change the? That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I like that idea. Thank you. get that out of there. Okay. So we know the y values. They're coming over here. Amplification. Again, that could be whatever kind of height change you want to introduce in there, whether it's plus or minus 5 or plus or minus 10, whatever you want. It's interesting now, for the next part, what used to be the beam depth, that was kind of the base of that. What I really want to do is take this value, I can add it to the old z's and add this plus or minus to it, you know, and just compute the new z that way. Maybe that's the easiest way to do it. All I can do is a separate value and then add it in later. But it really is, this is going to be like the old or the previous z value. Okay, plus or minus this. So what I'm going to do is take the old Z's that used to be there, the ones that we sort of pulled out over here, and bring those in. So what's going to happen is there's the old Z values, which were all in the 20s, and now there's going to be these new improved values, which are going to have the sine wave. So as opposed to sort of just being kind of this straight line, 
controller update for me. It will give me these new values. Again, I'll force it by putting a watch in there. So now, uh, I used to be sort of a straight line from 25 down to 23 or something like that. Now I've got these z values that have a lot of kind of curviness to them. Okay, so we are ready. I have a bunch of x's, I have a bunch of y's, I have some new improved z values. I can make these into a series of points and then basically make a curve out of that. And I'll apologize that this is getting so kind of seems convoluted. There's actually sort of a real logic to this. It just sort of is a lot of individual steps to make that happen. We'll say point by coordinates, x, y, z. Out of there. So my new improved curve is going to be defined by Those are the z's. In terms of the x's and y's, it's just the old x's and y's that always used to be there, the original ones that we came from. So I'm going to get this list of x's. And this list of y's. OK. So what has all that been? What we've really just been doing is basically defining a curve, which is a sine wave, which is based on an old straight line. And we're going to do a similar sort of thing. If you want a scallopy edge on the end of your shell, it's the same sort of thing. We're going to take a curve, kind of basically grab all the x's and y's, and just figure out some sort of difference to the z value to introduce that. Because you'll have an x and you'll have a y. We just need to sort of do something to kind of scale the z out of it. But we can look at that. Yes? One question I have is if you're not starting with the line and if you're starting with num's curve, yeah. um, when you click on the array corner box, it says num nerves curve degree 2. Um, it does, is that concerning? Wait, wait, say it again. Um, usually, or in the example here, yes. this is a line yes. from start and end point. Yes. Um, here it's a curve, and then the list below is this NURBS curve. Okay, so what we'll do is, that's a list of a bunch of curves. We'll grab one of the curves, because there's actually five or six of them there. Mm -hmm. So just choose list, get it on item at index, and mm -hmm. choose one of the curves. And then we'll do the same thing where we did the curve, uh, param point at, uh, what is it? Yeah, the point where we put the curves. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll look. Yes. It's the, so. Yeah, you're going to pull out a single curve and do it. What I did it was with a line, but basically, as soon as you go through and right here, curve point at parameter, I yeah. did it with a line. So even here, there's three different curves. You, know, you could pull out just one of them, and then it will be the same from here forward. So it's just the link into curve dot yeah. point. And back. here, I would just pull out the first one yeah, and bring it up there. Perfect. Okay, so. I have now created <coughs> this kind of list of points, this points that is x, y, z. You can even sort of look at it over here in the geometry window. Let's see if I can zoom on out and see it. Can you see those points kind of hanging around in there following that curve? Okay. Those are the new improved points that are going to represent the ends as opposed to the straight line points. So what I need to do is basically take these points and make a curve out of them, a smooth fit curve, and then swap it in for that last line. OK, so let's show you what that's like. We'll come back over here. We'll say super. I'm going to say curve by points. Uh, where'd it go? That's 
my poly curve. I'll go for the other one. I like the nervous curve better. Okay. This will draw that curve. Let that kind of draw itself in there. Okay. See, so you sort of see that curve. So, boy, this has been a lot of work to kind of get something with second. The hardest part about trying to do this whole assignment is really just trying to come up with that curve and make it make sense. But once you have that curve, again, what we have to do is just swap it in for the last line. Okay, and that sounds like, oh, this is going to be like a lot of work because we've been putting in a lot of work to get to this point. But it's actually pretty easy because what happens is as soon as we have that curve, it's basically swapping into this list create where we had, we took the three different lines. So all I'm really going to do is take that curve. Let's see if I can do this without sort of... Uh, of breaking things. Go from here and take it in as the last line. And believe it or not, everything else should update itself because what's going to happen is the endpoints are now all going to use my curvy curve as opposed to the straight line. So you should start seeing some wavy lines kind of happen here in the background instead. You can see them. So back over here, you know, as opposed to being going to the uh, straight line, it's going to the curve. So even back over here, you've got this weird kind of wavy structure going on over there. Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap this. I apologize, I didn't get to the surface by lock yeah, as we were working here together. The whole notion is you could take any two or three of these curves and lock them together in a surface and subdivide that. But the whole thing about creating the surface and the panels on the surface is really you just need to go through and basically if you create a surface and then say subdivide the surface, you're going to get groups of points. It's basically giving you a grid of points on an XY or UV grid. Okay, super. You can do it that way and then you need to quad the points plotting them to kind of make the four corner points, uh, flatten it, and then say adaptive panel on that flattened list. That's sort of, you know, we, we, we'll do that an awful lot. Stick around for another few minutes if you want to, we'll get it done in a few, uh, we'll do it together with you guys, but I'll let you guys go from each go. Um, if you don't want to create the surface and you just want to do it directly, you actually have enough points. Like you have all these ribs, you have points on the ribs. You could just take that grid of points and quad that grid of points. It really just depends on whichever way you want to do it, because it's it kind of works out about the same. If you have enough rib points, then you don't need to go through and make the surface. If you want to make the surface, that's a perfectly way, good way to do it too. Because all the surface is really doing is smoothing out between all the different curves. Okay, let us go ahead. I'll quit now in terms of the recording and like folks need to go to go and stuff like that. I'm going to be here for office hours. So if anyone wants to see me over the surfaces and all that kind of stuff, I'll do it right after this. But actually, well, I'll keep the recording going because I'll just do it on the recording so people get it in case you happen to miss it. So we can play the game to the surface or not. But uh, if anyone needs to go, please do because uh, we're just hanging here for office hours. Okay. Yes. No. What you got? Oh, I'll come back at a later time so this can be done. Otherwise, I'm going to spend five minutes doing this and then we'll be there. Okay, so basically, if anyone wants to go through and create a surface, it's actually pretty easy. What we have here is we have a list of three different curves. Two of them are lines and one's a sort of straight curve. So there's a list of three curves right there. If you really, if you want to create this by doing it as a surface, do this. It's like, uh, is it loft by surface or surface by loft? Okay. You notice there's two different functions there. There's one where you give it a list of curves and it will sort of interpolate between them. 
You can do this other one where you have a guiding curve, okay, which is like a profile, a sweep, okay, or several cross sections. This, this is kind of the equivalent of, oh, it's like a blend versus a swept blend. I'm just going to use the one that gives it a series of cross sections if I choose that. And you basically say, let me feed it a list of different lines or sections. It's this list. And then I'll make a surface just by pulling those together. What that'll do is that'll take the lowest line, the intermediate line, and then the wavy surface. And it's a, it, uh, basically put them together. Notice that this doesn't exactly go through and follow the curvature in exactly the same way. Because it's doing its best to put a best fit surface in there. So you know, if you subdivide this surface, it'll put panels there, but they may miss the kind of defining lines. That's the, why what I'll often do is take the defining lines and instead panelize that. So let me kind of show you what I mean by that. So this works. It's just sort of a question of how well it fits. But the other way to approach this is, let me turn off that slot loft. It's as follows. You got all these lines, which are kind of hanging around here, which go from, or curves, which go from here to the middle, out to the wavy curve on the end. And if what you'd like to do is think about those as being lines that are sort of the borders of panels, what you can do is as follows. You have a bunch of curves. Those curves are really, where do we find them? They are actually right here. Here's the nerve curves. We transpose them. If you take those curves and you subdivide them, Point at parameter. Take care. You're welcome. And I'll say just zero to one to pound sign. I'll say it's really the number of panels. Oh, I'll say points. Oops, I goofed. It's there. For the number of panel points, oh, I'll just go through and say that I want to have, oh, eight panels per rib, or panel points, that gives me seven panels. Okay. Let's see if it refreshes itself and gets itself back out of trouble. Curves my points. Placing, cross product it. Oh, zero to one. Did I break it in here? Oh, I'm sorry. It's the it's same thing as last time. Jeez. Second dot. Okay, what that's going to do is take all of those, like 11 curves or something like that, it's going to put eight points on each of them here. So with those points, these curve points that were added, I basically have the same UV points, the same points that I would plot. So from this point out, it's really just the same as what some of you have done already, where you say quad points for a rectangular grid. Where's my quad? There's a from rectangular grid. So you basically take your points, you quad them. Okay, that makes groups of four. 
then you end up having to flatten them just because uh, you want to be able to get them not in rows and columns, but just as a single list. Okay. And then finally, that list is basically a list of groups of four points that you can then say adaptive component and then like uh, put the seamless panel in there. Okay, so just to finish it and now then I'll switch to office hours. I'll do family types. Okay, and then I'll say adaptive component by points, adaptive. Points. Okay. So I am going to pull in these points. I'm going to pull in my adaptive component. It uh, looks like I probably have to load one. So load in there a panel. I'll do my little rectangular seamless panel, which works 90% of the time. Not always, but it works most of the time. Actually, one that almost, almost works is not the aperture panel. What's wrong with the opening? Uh, the, oh, a sizable opening. That one is, that's a very reliable one. I like that one. I'll put that one in. So, I've got something where I have it adaptive compound or component by points. you going to scroll for me? Again, it's still recomputing or something like that. It's run started. Okay, there we go. I'll take those over there. I'll take my points over here. And really, that last little piece right here, so it's just really taking the curves, uh, breaking over a certain number of panel points, doing the quads and flattening it. Yeah. That'll actually go through and do that. What's going on here? It looks like it's still complaining. Oh, because I didn't put this up to the right thing. And where did it go? Is it a rectangular panel with opening? What's it called? Let's find you. We'll say panel. That's not it. Rectangular with a sizable opening. That's it. That's going to look for four points. It's going to get four points, so that should be happy. Now, what I should have done, just so uh, yeah, be a little clear, or a little more fluid, is probably turn it so it's manual now, since every time you change something, it's going to go through the automatic calculations. OK, that's it. So let us go ahead and break. I'm going to come around and get your office hours now. I just wanted to show you that last little piece. But hopefully, that'll be all the little pieces you need. So it's really just, the hardest part of this assignment really is, it's if you're going to go through and kind of do something with that sign wave, it's just how to slide that in there. Because it's really replacing something simple with something that's a little more complex. But let's go through and sort of see if that actually did what I wanted it to. I have my beautiful structure back there. And as kind of gronky looking as it is, There's my bus stop. <laughs> or something like that. With holes in it. With well, holes. Oh, but then again, yes, exactly. Hopefully a little rain. We, we'll uh, play next time with how you uh, close some of those holes based upon what's over your head. But this is going to be a starting point for now. OK, great. Let me stop the pa uh, pause the recording, and I'll just come around and just do office hours. OK, let's get it.